All right. Ait natas, everyone. So that means good morning uh, in our Holkaminam Salish language. I'm calling in from Vancouver Island uh, on Snanemoch territory. So um, as people are trickling in, we're going to get started with a little bit of uh, opening and um, welcoming our elder to open us up in a good way. And then I'll uh, be your master of ceremony today. So uh, we'll, I'll be walking with you throughout our virtual space. So find a seat that's comfortable for you. Um, suffering is optional. So if you need to move throughout the day, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, but we'll go ahead and get started. So good morning and thank you so much for coming. Um, today, we are very excited to be presenting the Circling Together for Wellness. And um, it's a virtual gathering for upholding um, our uh, Indigenous knowledge. So before we get too far in, uh, I would like to make sure that we open our virtual space in the best way possible. And so we've invited our elder Don Beecham uh, from Norway First Nation to uh, welcome us and open us up with a prayer. And then we'll get started with our day. So at this time, I'd like to invite our elder Don Beecham to share in any way that you see useful for us today. Haichka. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for that. Uh, I didn't know we had First Nations in Norway, so <laughs> so it belonged to the Norway House Cree Nation in northern Manitoba, Swampy Creek Country, so uh, um, Muskego Cree. So welcome, everybody. Uh, as uh, our hosts stated, my name, my Christian name is uh, Don Beecham, and my Cree name is Wapan Muskwa, which means uh, white bear or polar bear. And it's uh, my pleasure and honor to open this uh, gathering today. And uh, looking forward to the day. And uh, part of my job is to kind of help kind of set the tone for the meeting. So when I run out of words, that's when I reach for the drum and start singing. So I'm going to reach for the drum and start singing. <laughs> so I just invite everybody to. Put your feet flat on the floor. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Put your hands on your laps, palm up like this. Rest them on your laps. And just take a moment to acknowledge the drum. The elk that gave up its life, the, the drum, the wood that gave up its life. <clears throat> These are things that we have to continue to learn to redo and to bring back into our reality is to acknowledge all our relations. And uh, the universe is your relation. The creator is your relations. We're all related, not just in the human condition, but in the the animal, the ones that fly, the ones that swim, the ones that can see, the ones that cannot see. All the plants, even the, the rock, if you will, those are the first people ever on this earth when the earth was created. So within them, they have the knowledge of the creation of the earth. So I just take a moment and explain the song. The song is a calling song, calling all our ancestors our spirit helpers, all the uh, ones that work for the creator to come be with us, watch over us and take care of us today. And the indication of the palms being up is that we are welcoming whatever the creator and the grandfathers and grandmothers will bring for you today or what they will take from you today. If anything happens for you during the song, just acknowledge it and you know, be, have reverence for that connection. So again, I just get everybody just take a deep breath and let the song take you where it may. <clears throat> so listen to the vibration of the drum. Become the vibration. about what the drum is meant to all our cultures since time immemorial.
to the stillness outside of you, the stillness within you, and know that uh, your spirit is at ease, your mind will be at ease. And if your mind is at ease, your emotions will be at ease, and your body will be at ease. It's important to get to this place of stillness because this is where you're open and vulnerable to the ancestors, to your spirit helpers, and ultimately to all the ones that work with the Creator. And know this too, that you are the result of all the people that came before you. Their strength is your strength. You are in fact their crowning glory. You are the result of all of them that came before you. Just take that in for a moment and realize the magnitude of what's within you already. It's spoken in your DNA, it's in your ancestral memory. And it's that gift of knowing that we're born with. When people ask you the question, well, how do you know? The only answer you can give is because I've known and I've always known. So the creator always was, is, always will be. The creator and creator's wisdom be a little diokan in my language, spirit that is of the creator. So that spirit of yours always was, is, always will be. A good description of humility is a person who knows where they've been, knows where they are, and knows where they're going. And just want to take this moment to, uh, to acknowledge the total uniqueness of every individual that is with us here today. That when you were born, you broke the mold, there's not going to be another one like you. So if you can allow yourself to feel cherished at this moment, that is your ancestors. When we sit in their presence, we feel less than a grain of sand. We were so grateful to be in that presence. That's that welling up we're feeling. And of course, the hurt child needs to cry. So that's also the welling up. But also in this instance, you are in the presence of the ones who love you the most. 
always have loved you and always will love you. Each and every one of us, you know, those of us who, uh, I guess, who fortunate enough, to have, fortunate enough to have children, when we held that first one that came out, we knew we'd give our life, no questions asked. But we'd already forgotten at that point that some looked at us the same way. Some looked at mom and dad the same way. Someone looked at grandma and grandpa the same way. Yes, we feel alone a lot of times, but your ancestors have always been with you and always will be. Even when we're throwing ourselves away in self-destruction because of our trauma we've been through, they love you through that unconditionally. They hold you near and dear to them. So with that, I'll turn the mic back over to the host and have a beautiful day today. With that, I say kakia o no akamakana koma relations. Hi, Chikandan. That was a really beautiful opening. And thank you so much for putting your energy and setting the tone uh, for our day. Um, I also appreciate your patience uh, with my um, misstep on your nation. I haven't had an opportunity to meet your territory yet, so um, I apologize. Um, so thank you kindly. Um, so now that we have set the stage for doing our work in the best way possible, I'll briefly introduce myself. I appreciate uh, the chat box has a little bit of more of my information, but um, my traditional name is Tiaktanat. Uh, Tanitsanal Staminas, uh, so acknowledging this name of people today as I uh, visit uh, and uh, work on their territory. I'm from Shimanas First Nation on Vancouver Island. I also have Danish and Scottish background. Um, and I'm the Director of Research and Knowledge Exchange with First Nations Health Authority. Um, and I'm very excited to be here with some of my colleagues today on the call. So wanting to uh, hold up my team that I'm working with and, and give my gratitude and love and respect for all the hard work that's gone into this work today. So it'll, it's going to be a great day. Um, I'm gonna start with a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll jump into our work together. Um, so to start, we do have closed captions, so uh, that option is available if you go to uh, the panel at the bottom of your screen and click CC. Um, and uh, if you need any support at any time, you can do a, a message to a direct message to um, uh, the FNHA chat host uh, or um, Sakshi Tanaja, Tana, I don't, I'm sorry, uh, Tanaja is, is how I'm reading your last name, so I apologize if I mispronounced. Um, so you can go ahead and reach out to either of those names for um, additional questions, and we want to acknowledge that uh, Accurate Real Time is providing this service for us today. Um, so we are being recorded at this time, and uh, so we appreciate your ability or your availability and your patience in, in allowing us to do that. If there are any pressing concerns with that, please reach out to our hosts. Um, but for your knowledge, we are um, uh, recording and uh, that's so that we can post it afterwards for others who weren't able to make it uh, to observe. Uh, and also you'll be able to review any of the amazing work that's being shared today. Again, if you want to apply it in your journeys uh, after our session's over. Um, so we do have an opportunity in our sessions today for uh, questions and answers. And so you will be given uh, opportunity to give those questions into the chat box and we will do our best to uh, navigate them. We will, we are on somewhat of a, a, a time frame, uh, So we'll do our best to navigate that and respect everybody's uh, time that they have here today. But um, please do feel free to offer your questions. And if we can't answer them today in the session, we will certainly be looking at how we can make those connections um, at another time. 
So um, as far as it goes with our, uh, our setting and our tone today, again, acknowledging our elder and having such beautiful opening words and, and uh, who we are and, and how we belong and who we identify as is every part of who we are in all aspects of our life. And so if we can uh, respect that in the way that we conduct ourselves online, we'd much appreciate it. Um, so ensuring that uh, everybody is um, conducting themselves with safety and honesty and uh, and uh, accountability in our dialogues today. Um, we uh, do have an ability to monitor to a, a best of our, of our ability within the virtual space. So any um, violence or discrimination or um, uh, um, you know, unkindness to uh, races, ethnicity, ethnicity, sexual orientation, national origin, gender identity, religious affiliation, age or disabilities will not be tolerated and will respectfully navigate that if it comes up and I'm sure it won't. Um, but thank you for, um, uh, you know, aligning yourselves with a kindness and respect today. Um, we also uh, ask that you don't assume anyone's pronoun, gender, knowledge base, and or their name or appearance. Um, so we are all um, part of a larger sacred family and creator's children. And so if we can treat one another with those um, that variety and diversity, it's important in this space today. Um, we also ask that you take space and make space. So share your perspective, but allow others to be heard. It's interesting in a, in a virtual space to gauge the, um, the, the room and understand who might need to be uh, speaking. One of the, um, uh, the values that I've had around uh, my, my own way in conducting is that I do really like to talk. So sometimes I try and make sure that I have a couple, couple second pause to invite space to those that are exercising their, um, their voice. So um, or still learning how to speak their minds. So re really wanting to make sure that our space is open for everybody to um, uh, offer what they need to offer. And please feel free to take what you feel that you need to take. Um, again, like I said at the beginning, um, you know, suffering is optional. So if you need to take a time out or a break, please do that. Uh, and we also want to uh, want to know if there's anything that we need to be made aware of to uh, allow this space to be a bit safer for you. So please do reach out to our hosts if you need to. And so those are the FNHA chat host or SFU Public Square. If it is a, a comment that you need to have somewhat private, please make sure that the chat box is chosen to talk to only them and not the whole group um, and uh, and we'll do our best to support you in the virtual space to be as comfortable as possible um, we do have some breakout sessions today um, there will be a, a plenary as well um, so we will um, will be we'll have a plenary first followed by a break and then come back with dr ted Mala. Uh, and he'll lead us in the breakout session portion. And so uh, they're running back to back and you'll have an opportunity to choose which breakouts to um, go into. So you'll have the company of FNHA staff um, and others um, in our group to accompany you. And we will also be recording those um, pieces as well. Uh, so the last piece is just with a quick Zoom orientation. So I've got this beautiful slide here. We do have some pieces um, that will um, uh, within our presentations that will invite um, annotations so you can draw and put on stickers and all sorts of contributions. So if you don't have an annotation uh, banner at the top of your Zoom screen, right up where it says you're hosting Kate or you're viewing Katie's screen, there's options. And if you click options and go down to annotate, that's where a banner will come up and you'll be able to contribute um, as you'd like. Um, and those are for certain times on the um, uh, during the presentation. In addition to that, you can start and stop your video. Um, so if you have an itch you need to scratch or perhaps pick your nose or whatever it is that you need to do to feel comfortable, make sure your video is off. Um, we also will be um, assisting with the mute and unmute at some times. So certainly want to invite questions and answers, but during the presentations, we'll ask if folks to mute. Um, and uh, if at any time you'd like to raise your hand or offer any reactions, you can do that as well by pressing the little smiley face down in the corner and it'll pop up a couple of reactions that you can contribute. So although we're in a virtual space, we do really want to have uh, um, 
an engaged and, and collaborative session because everybody here is so much uh, has so much importance and so everybody serves a purpose in our space today. And finally, I'd like to uh, introduce Tiare Lani. And uh, so I'm pleased to welcome them. Uh, and they're an Indigenous graphic recorder who will create a visual story uh, record for our plenary session. And um, none of us are neutral listeners. It's important that we center Indigenous voices alongside Indigenous mark makers and story recorders. So Tiare witnesses and reflects the story through a kaleidoscope of lenses, including a mixed race, urban, Indigiqueer person as a mixed race, urban, Indigiqueer person. So uplifting other Indigenous women and uh, femmes work feeds Tiare's soul creating images as a decolonial de approach to making information more accessible and honors the life and energy of our stories. So thank you very much for having um, uh, opportunity and demonstration of how it is that we collect and, and reflect on information. And this is one of many ways that we'll be listening and, and carrying this work into our next seven generations. So haichika um, tiari. Um, so finally, we have uh, our, well, finally from me, I'll stop talking very soon. So I'm very excited to introduce Namaste Marsden uh, Mestem Kuch. And she is from the, uh, the Wilk Gamlakyach Lak Ganada Nation. Thank you very much for the pronunciation. Namaste. Also a territory I haven't had the opportunity to meet. Um, and uh, in English, that's the Frog Clan. So I will allow uh, Namaste to start in just a few short minutes, but um, I would like to uh, contribute to some of the things that we find exciting about Namaste. And uh, so she'll be presenting academic publishing, theft or protection, seeking sovereignty over indigenous knowledge with lessons from indigenous led publishing. So it's very exciting presentation and very quickly, I'm um, wanting to share that Namaste has over 16 years of professional experience with Indigenous programs and organizations in health policy and research at a local, provincial and national level. Her areas of interest include hereditary and modern governance, OCAP application and First Nations research and ethics, and Indigenous knowledge and modern applications. She served as the Executive Director of Aboriginal Health Research Network Se Secretariat and as the first ever managing editor of the International Journal of the Indigenous Health, which was formerly the JAH. Namaste is currently the Director of Indigenous Engagement with the Faculty of Medicine, Health Engagement at University of British Columbia, and holds an adjunct faculty position with Simon Fraser University in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Um, so throughout Namaste's presentation, we'll be monitoring the chat box and have opportunity for questions and answers, but I understand her presentation's interactive as well. So welcome, Namaste. Thank you so much for coming, and I'll give you the floor. Wow. Um, first off, I just want to say um, that was so beautiful, uh, Dawn, and... Um, I had grounded myself initially and that just kind of um yeah really opened up that channel to the ancestors and I really want to thank you for that uh and I also wanted to um say thank you to Courtney and to acknowledge her um uh, as the first permanent First Nations from BC director for research and knowledge exchange and so I'm really um very happy about that and uh if you have worked with me um, in any capacity, you know that I am always trying to make those spaces for um, people from uh, BC First Nations and Indigenous people and uh, create those leadership opportunities. So um, congratulations. Um, <clears throat> so depending on your background, uh, where you come from, uh, this may or may not be a pr provocative title. Um, for me, it's more of a rhetorical question, um, and you'll hear a little bit why, uh, and um, <clears throat> I think when we're working in Indigenous um, issues of any kind, we are always going back um, to the source of uh, not just our strength uh, and who we are, but also the source of um, the pain 
uh, and the things that have happened um, since colonization and contact. So I do try to address these um, in different ways uh, throughout the talk, um, but there's not enough time for everything. And so if there is gaps uh, or if there is something um, that I have not explained very well, please feel free to put a question in the chat. Uh, Katie's monitoring it and um, <clears throat> she'll also be helping me with the slides uh, today. Um, the other thing uh, I just wanted to say is um, this is a little bit new for me. I'm the kind of person who likes to be in charge of the project uh, and ensure that we have uh, leadership um, working really well. Uh, and presenting um, the highest quality work um, from First Nations and Indigenous peoples um, from who we are. And so this is a bit new for me uh, doing this kind of talk. And so I just wanted to uh, express my personal gratitude for this opportunity um, to share what I've learned uh, over the last 10 years in terms of uh, our knowledge um, and where we need more of us um, in the research process, but also just in terms of recognition of our rights. So we can get started. So we, we often start with uh, acknowledging and being grateful um, for all of the help uh, and all of the people who have supported this work along the way. Um, of course, the First Nations people of British Columbia a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about here in relation to publishing, especially with this uh, really unique um, double volume of the uh, International Journal for Indigenous Health special issue, um, that they they're um, they're a huge part of that, and they are the foundation for it. And so that's really um, the biggest acknowledgement I want to make. But of course, uh, the First Nations Health Authority and the Squamish Nation where um, all the work that I did on this um, uh, took place. I also want to acknowledge our allied and First Nations and Indigenous staff. Um, I had to think about this a little bit yesterday. Uh, I do want to acknowledge allied staff by name um, because they had a huge learning curve and their work is really incredible. And it's not to diminish the First Nations and Indigenous staff. Um, but we do like to hold up those leaders in particular, and I think you're going to hear from them today. Um, also, uh, the special edition editors, Dr. Evan Adams, Sonia Isaacman, and Dr. Ted Mala, who I had a great pleasure of working uh, closely with uh, the three of them. The current editor for the journal, Dr. Suzanne Stewart, and uh, her team at Wakabaness Bryce Institute for Indigenous Health. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about uh, why I really want to have a heartfelt um, thank you to the FIRE Collective. That's a, a large national project that was led by Dr. Janet Smiley. Um, my work with her and Leona Starr, which I'll talk about, and in particular, Mindy Denny, uh, who does work with the Regional Health Survey uh, and with the First Nations Information Governance Center, and really um, was uh, the, uh, the force and the inspiration uh, for new policy um, at the Canadian Journal for Public Health. Madeline Dion Stout, who is always incredible and brilliant, the elders team and staff at Well Living House. And everyone here today, um, please take time to acknowledge yourself and the amazing work that you've done uh, and this space that we've created. This space is for you and this is about you. And when we first put this grant application in, I can't remember when, <laughs> Um, we really wanted the space for you to share with each other, and I just am so um, grateful uh, for um, your time today um, of all the things you could have done. So thanks. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we, we need to start always at the beginning. Uh, for those of us who know the history, um, the know, know the history of your nation or your nations, um, where you come from, your community, um, <clears throat> there are many uh, Canadians who still don't understand why we talk about this. Uh, so before I do land acknowledgements, I always talk about why. Um, because for us, land acknowledgements is about our nation to nation protocols. Uh, it's not necessarily about talking about where we currently live. So Terra Nullius is a 
<clears throat> is a legal concept, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but it's this idea that the land is empty, which of course it wasn't. Um, when uh, the first uh, explorers and colonizers first came to the Americas, uh, we had huge advanced civilizations, um, larger even than in Egypt. Uh, the Mayan civilization, for example, was absolutely phenomenal in terms of its advances. We've lost a lot of uh, knowledge um, and gains um through that colonization process not just the lives but all of those knowledge advances um and it's like we're starting from scratch again but not necessarily in the best place um and so i don't um uh i don't necessarily worship in an altar of western knowledge i do want to acknowledge all of those societies that pre-existed here in the americas uh on your right you'll see um not a <clears throat> definitive map, but this is um, a map from the first piece, sorry, the first um, People's Cultural Council, and this is around our language groups. So this is a close approximation of what we might consider our um, international national bound boundaries between each other. Um, next slide. So I'm Gitsan, uh, as was mentioned, and um, <clears throat> I hold a hereditary name, Masumtach, which is, um, it's a name that's been passed down for thousands of years. And uh, our hereditary chiefs have uh, hold names and hold histories and can trace back every person who held that name. And we have oral history that has been passed down that's now being um, corroborated, corroborated. Uh, through archaeology and other West, Western scientific methods, but we've documented all of the major events. And so um, I have great pride about uh, my people and where I come from, but I also have great humility about where I am, and I do my best uh, to learn about those protocols and those leaders and those knowledge holders where I am. Two of like my very beloved people I have here, um, the late and the great Leonard George, uh, who did everything from his heart, uh, who followed his protocol in adopting uh, the First Nations Health Authority staff into the Takaya uh, Wolf Clan, which is how we also uh, do our, um, this is how we also bring people into our nation as well. Uh, we have formal adoption processes that carries rights and responsibilities and it's a way to bring people into the culture and into that respectful way of living um, and being with each other. Uh, Sequalia, which if you live in Vancouver, um, you will have been blessed to hear her do formal um, welcomes at events. Uh, this again is part of a protocol in terms of uh, welcoming people to the territories. Um, there's a picture of tribal journeys, which is an amazing experience for Indigenous and First Nations youth, and they build protocol into that process where they're welcomed and invited onto the land. The open arms for the totem pole that's shown there at Ambleside, again, that's showing uh, that you're welcome. Uh, if you're, if you don't see that, if you, um, ask and you're not allowed to enter that was also respected too and so we're starting from a foundation that our laws have been broken that uh, not only have all of these atrocities occurred uh, but people are not being asked um, to enter to do things um, on lands and so I wanted to ground this in protocol and law uh, because that's what it means for us there's also a picture um, there was a wonderful young man uh, who did a tour with the We Walk Together project, um, which uh, many of the team at First Nations Health Authority are still working on. And I took my sons uh, to see this um, after we did our, our trip um, as part of the, the research project. There's a, a rock um, <clears throat> in the Fraser River that marks the boundary between the Fraser Canyon nations and the, and the Stolo in the valley. And they know this boundary. We had those boundaries. We have those boundaries um, throughout the province. It's just that it is not um, expressed anywhere. 
um, Canadians don't know what those boundaries are, but our people do know them uh, and still respect them. They were also marked, this one in particular, uh, the young man told a story about that rock being marked and uh, protected by a warrior who um, could no longer live in, in society. He'd been at war too long. And so he had his role was to live in the mountains and to protect that boundary. So these are real, um, uh, very long uh, histories. And that's really what's behind the land acknowledgement. For us, a land acknowledgement is not uh, a performative act. And it's not um, something that we do as part of like a good morning. Um, they have formality um, and they have international connotations. Next slide. So with that, I just want to acknowledge that I am a guest. I hope I'm a guest. I would say uninvited, um, but I do have um, friends and colleagues now, and I do feel like I have been on this learning path to be um, a guest. Uh, we do have responsibilities when we are in others' territories to learn protocols, uh, to be respectful, to be humble. I won't take up time in my presentation today, but part of um, our protocols are also to talk about where we come from. That could take 10 to 15 minutes. That's part of the respect when you're coming into someone else's territory that you tell who your people are, what your lineages are, and where you come from. You might also offer um, a song. You might also um, dance um, to show uh, goodwill and to develop that relationship. I also acknowledge and give thanks uh, to my ancestors, my loved ones who've recently passed um, to the spirit uh, world and who walk with me and help me and guide me. And also recently um, with the help of <clears throat> uh, friends um, and people who have done this uh, longer than me, I also now in my own way acknowledge and give thanks to the ancestors of the land uh, where I am. When you're naturally drawn to places, you know where the power is um and so that's part of um my life here currently uh in north vancouver and then of course um we can't talk about land acknowledgements without talking about land back um it has always been about the land for indigenous people we are always uh working to get uh land back that was taken through colonization next slide So <clears throat> this is kind of how um, I've organized what I want to talk with you about today. Uh, it is a very long talk, and I encourage you to turn off your camera, sit back, listen, um, you know, take a bio break if you need to. Uh, there's one very short wellness break in here, and, um, and then we will uh, have questions afterwards. <clears throat> Not all of these sections or topics are have equal weighting. Some are bigger than others. Uh, and I hopefully you will understand why um, that was done as we go through it. Next slide. Okay, we're gonna try this. <laughs> Katie and I were very excited to try this. Um, so I wanted to indigenize uh, these um, interactive uh, things that we do uh, in the Zoom room these days. So if you have a clan, um, please feel free to identify um, with your clan. Uh, if you want to just like check in with how you're feeling, or if you don't have a clan and you want to identify with an animal, um, uh, please just do so. And um, this is just to acknowledge uh, you and how you're doing. Um, and there's there's a wide range here. We've got a mama bear, uh, an otter. I'm assuming that's a male bear rolling around, bison, and orca. So um, please just take a moment to um, think about which one you identify with. Just to remind everyone, the annotate button is under view options at the top of your screen, and you can go to a stamp and pick a little stamp if you want. There's a heart. We're already getting a few in. And that's a raven at the top, just in case here. Not up on the birds. Eagle and falcon and robin. Robin has a lot of spiritual significance for us.
I love the hearts. That's great. So we could we could do this with many things. I'm looking at Hazel's background. She's got gorgeous cedar. We could have, you know, which medicine you identify with. There are um, gendered medicines. I know um, in in some of the prairie based nations. So. Um, you can do this in whatever way you want, but I think uh, the main thing I just wanted to show is that we can uh, ground uh, this kind of collaborative work uh, in, in our own cultures. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, thank you for participating. Okay, so the next one we wanted to do is just to think a little bit about uh, what brought you here today. Um, we sort of anticipated what you might be interested in, so please go ahead and stick a heart um, or a sticker on your area of interest. If you don't see yourself reflected here, please uh, feel free to put it in the chat and share with them um, with everybody. And for our FNHA researchers on the call, I'm sure they will find this process interesting <laughs> in terms of priority setting. Yeah, it's very well distributed. Oh, that's awesome. I also just love seeing all the hearts for Indigenous knowledge. <laughs> That makes me happy. Um, it's wonderful. That's great. Thank you so much. It also gives everybody a sense too um, with each other of, of your interest areas, which I think is important and you'll carry that through uh, into your discussions today with um, these really exciting presentations from the authors. And thank you so much for the ones in the chat. Okay. So, um, I wanted to kind of just ground us a little bit. Uh, we've done a, uh, a territorial and a spiritual grounding. I hope you feel um, really good where you are. Uh, you feel centered in yourself. Um, <clears throat> in terms of grounding for what we're going to talk about today and what you're going to uh, be talking about in your sessions um, for the duration of the day, I really wanted to ground us um, in this idea that we are in a unique time. And that's been said um, about every time. Um, every time has um, has very significant events, uh, hardships, and opportunities. But I have talked to many people, and there is a sense that we are in a very unique time, and it's a time of opportunity, and that we need to move forward very quickly. Um, I would say maybe this is also due to the um, fact that I'm a mother and um, an auntie. And I, I really want to leave um, this world as much as I can in a better place, knowing that our time here is so short um, in life. So in terms of our rights um, and protecting and upholding our knowledge, this is not something um, that really it, people talk about that much. Um, we talk about some of these bigger issues. Um, especially around land uh, and resources and health. And those are all very, very important. Um, but you will hear um, concepts and uh, program foundations such as Culture Heals Us, uh, Cultures Our Wellness. And so we really need to think about what are we doing to protect um, our knowledge uh, and to uh, uphold our rights. Next slide. 
and of course, we can't really talk about that without acknowledging um, that currently the biggest threats to protection of our rights, of our knowledge, is the ongoing colonization that uh, we've been experiencing since contact. Um, what I, we're seeing now much more, um, it's always been a feature uh, in the academy, um, but we're also seeing this in the arts, uh, is appropriation. And so that's taking something that's not yours um, and asserting it as yours. And again, um, going back to, you know, when I was talking about when we would take a long time to talk about where we come from, part of that is that we are establishing who we are and what we can speak to, and that we're also then acknowledging and hearing uh, what everybody else has the authority um, to speak to and what they own. So that's part of um, what's built into our, um, our culture and our society, um, especially here on the West Coast. Uh, and then, of course, racism, uh, ever present, um, incredibly damaging. Uh, it takes people's lives on a daily basis. And so this failure uh, to implement and recognize our rights has um, very real impacts. And we need to acknowledge that um, every day as well. Next slide. So I, I wanted to kind of get us started um, thinking about words from this really incredible leader, George Erasmus. Um, I've highlighted the words that really resonate here. Um, everything uh, he says is um, brilliant, um, but just to remind that there was no conquest, there was no giving up of rights. Uh, this was a partnership expressed in law and he's of course referring to the Royal Proclamation of 1763. Um, for Canadians who are um, not as familiar with our history uh, and uh, what our full rights um, recognition um, that we are seeking. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, there's many volumes, but I would encourage you to read the entire um, Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Next slide. Uh, and then in terms of jurisdiction uh, around um, rights to our knowledge, uh, this would be uh, captured from my perspective under, under Article 31. And so there's also an acknowledgement that the states, so the provinces, um, the feds, will take effective measures, and that includes resources um, to protect these rights. Next slide. So <clears throat> in, our, in our cultures and societies, we have our own leaders. Um, we have our own lawmakers. Uh, here, at least, and I have pictures here from my nation, um, and uh, especially on the west coast of, of what is now British Columbia, uh, we have hereditary chiefs, we have um, matriarchs. Those are the individuals who embody and act our laws. They're not currently recognized by Western society for that. Um, and also, we are uh, intrinsically tied to the land, everything about um, our legal systems and our uh, cultures and values is intricately tied in relationship uh, to land and um, the, the winged and the four-leggeds uh, that we share with. Next slide. And so just to um, have this reminder that despite um, a vast amount of evidence uh, that Indigenous people are really uh, meant to be um, the past, present, and future stewards of the land, that we have a lot of conflict and lack of recognition of that and um, state violence uh, against our people when that, those rights are asserted. Next slide. And then just a note on validation. This is something that comes up if you work with, um, with the university, within the university, uh, it's still a pervasive idea, this idea that we need our knowledge validated, that if I say, um, you know, that cedar uh, is a medicine, that then we need a study to, to prove that. We might want to learn more about what cedar actually does, um, but those are questions that our people will need to be guiding, uh, and we don't really need to have um, what we say uh, that has been established over thousands of years. We don't need... Um, further proof that that's actually true. And that does happen um, quite a bit. Uh, here's a quote from John Burroughs, who's an Anishinaabe um, legal scholar. 
where he's talking about um, the harms and really the violence that happens when uh, elders and chiefs and uh, our leaders are in court cases and are being uh, subjected um, to very disrespectful and legal breaches um, of our rights in the process um, that the Western legal system does to establish um, what is so-called evidence. Next slide. Okay, <laughs> we don't have time to talk about all of these. These are all deep dives. Um, I would say um, this, um, from my perspective, and many Indigenous people's perspective, this is, um, uh, uh, it's an assertion, it's a crown assertion uh, here in Canada, but it's also um, a colonial fiction. So this is a doctrine that was uh, discussed in a case um, in the United States. And going back to this idea of terra nullius that I talked about at the beginning, <clears throat> this concept was used to justify uh, the claim of lands that, uh, of course, did not belong to them. And there was this idea that if you were a non-Christian, um, that basically you were invisible. And so that land was uh, free for the taking. This, of course, is um, this is like a mental trick, I think, that people um, played on themselves. Uh, it has no real foundation, but we live with this um, doctrine and this and other Western uh, concepts um, and ideas about Indigenous people are so pervasive. Uh, we need to be always aware of where it comes from um, because it comes at us in uh, interpersonal situations and in all of our dealings with uh, Western systems in Canada and the United States. Next slide. So along with this is this concept of discovery. So this is something that <clears throat> uh, permeates um, science in particular. We still use this language of discovery um, and we are completely uh, blind as a society to the knowledge um, that's indigenous to the people and the land where we are. Um, we're seeing some slow changes here in British Columbia um, in terms of acknowledging um, that we need to talk about uh, what happened in residential schools in public schooling and that we need to talk about um, the land of the uh, where we currently are and there are some things happening um, that are exciting but we're really so far away from what would be a full acknowledgement um, of nations wherever you are and to have that expressed in um, every educational institution uh, next slide I'm not going to speak to all of the points because um, we do have a lot to get through. Um, but if you are interested in um, seeing a copy of the presentation, um, just uh, let Katie know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so very similar themes here that you'll see throughout this. Um, we do have some gains in terms of it recognizing validity of oral history in the legal system, for example, um, some more movement around uh, recognition of our Indigenous laws. Um, but we are in a time of racism and uh, we have a long way to go to be supporting our Indigenous knowledge based systems as fundamental um, and to be deconstructing and decolonizing the Western apparatus that is very much um, in control of how we think about um, our people, our lands, and our knowledge. Next slide. So I just wanted to take a moment to talk about this very recent example. Um, I was preparing, um, well, over a month ago for this talk, and this uh, came up on my LinkedIn feed and really stopped me cold and really had me in a very um, deep place for a couple days. <clears throat> so if you haven't heard about this case, uh, this is uh, the Lakota Nation uh, and the Standing Rock uh, Sioux Tribal Council that has um, <clears throat> been working with uh, an, uh, an organization that's leveraged a great deal of federal funding, um, that has um, done a lot of um, research and collected a lot of um, knowledge from elders and Lakota speakers. And... Um, has made claims that they are supportive uh, of the Loco Lakota people and that they don't own it, but in fact, in um, their practice have asked um, for money when people ask for their resources or 
have stalled in in uh, when they've asked to get those recordings back. So there has been a legal action that's commenced, and um, there's just something so fundamentally egregious about this claim of copyright um, of a uh, nation's ancient um, and inherent knowledge. Um, I just don't have words for it. Next slide. So I just wanted to highlight um, a couple things. Um, one um, from this uh, uh, this man who is um, taking on uh, this organization, uh, this very clear assertion of rights to our knowledge. Um, so our rights to our stories, our songs, um, our language, it does not matter uh, who collected it. It is owned by that nation and every individual in that nation. And then also the native Hawaiian attorney, an indigenous attorney who is helping them with the case, uh, which I think is a really important thing for us to think about. <clears throat> so indigenous data is, I mean, all data, uh, you know, there's a market for it um, uh, on uh, the other web, <laughs> uh, not the internet, um, but all data has become a commodity and indigenous data in particular. And so she says, uh, data is the new oil. And this concept of um, a gold rush, um, uh, extractive research, these are all concepts that we're very familiar with in the research realm. And we need to be very always thinking about that, especially when we're, we are ourselves creating those partnerships with um, indigenous people that we are not um, also being part of that colonial imperative. Next slide. So another example um, is uh, our Gidimgen, so our totem poles. I have a picture um, that I took during a pole raising in our community and a picture I think he's my father's cousin. <laughs> um, it's one of my favorite pictures of our totem poles um, from Leslie McLean. And uh, this really shows um, our Adawak, um, our oral history. And it, it confirms it's like a deed. It's a legal title. Totem poles are a legal title to our land. They talk about our Ayuks, our crests, and they document our Adawak and history of the Wilk, which is our fundamental um, legal unit of organization. Um, that's who owns the territories is the will uh, and the chief. Uh, and this shows thousands of years of history and our relationship to our lahip, to our territories. Um, again, talking about um, this concept of um, why theft would not occur in our system, um, but is very pervasive in the Western system, is we have in our Lilligate Hall, the feast hall, um, you stand up and you speak to what you own. And then that is acknowledged by every other chief in the feast hall. That's how we confirm. There's a confirming process. Um, as I'll talk about later, part of the problem that we're seeing in Western academic publishing, we're not at those tables. We don't have those people on the publications. And so we're seeing unethical publishing practices today not in the past, today. Uh, and we have principles um, that are there to protect us and to protect our knowledge. And um, those are not being applied or it's falling down in the processes um, in universities. That's why we see indigenous led publications and indigenous led work, but we're not supported financially. So we'll talk a bit about that um, towards the end. Next slide. So to contrast what I've just shared with you about what totem poles mean for us, um, that they are significant in terms of uh, our ownership and our history and our territories. Um, when I do this talk uh, with mostly Canadians, I ask how many people know who Emily Carr is uh, and everybody puts up their hand. And um, so some of her work, had a very deep heartfelt appreciation for Indigenous peoples, for their artwork. Uh, but what happens um, in this space, in the academic space, is that then people look at what a non-Indigenous person has produced, and they look at that as the source of truth. That's just a view, that's just an interpretation, and it may or may not be informed. 
So just as people, when you go through university, you learn to like know your sources. That's what I'm asking everybody to do is to know your sources. When it's not, um, when it's being claimed by someone and they don't actually have the authority to speak on it, that's a risk um, and that's a problem. So um, I just wanted to note that when Emily Carr came to Get Meow to our community to paint this painting, um, pretty brave on her own. She had a cart. We have people telling the story about it. She had a cart with all of her supplies and I think her dog. And um, this was at a time before there was any uh, occupation in our lands by the Crown. Um, Get Meow kept out all white people, settlers, um, until residential schools. Residential schools are really horrific for all of the things that happened, but they're also horrific because they were designed specifically to destroy the culture, to create that break between the grandparents, the children, um, and to uh, destroy that knowledge, to destroy that language, and, and to um, uh, break the, the legal and social fabric so that then they could put in the band councils. This was all part of the policy imperative. And um, even in, you know, most parts of uh, what's now Canada, I've talked to people from Six Nations, for example, it was the same for them. They effectively kept the Indian agent out of their lands, but it was the residential schools that really broke that. And so that's what's also significant, not just the pain um, and the trauma that's inflicted uh, on generations. Next slide. Oh, we're at the wellness break already. Okay, so um, I'll just say here, we're gonna take one minute. Uh, I asked for two, Katie said, no, we're gonna do one. <laughs> uh, so feel free to turn off your camera for a second. Uh, we've got a young woman here from Tulalip. Um, I took these pictures off the internet. So she's pulling cedar. So this, you could just kind of do something like this. Uh, we also have some uh, Coast Salish pullers. Uh, and so that would be this way. I think, I don't think you get to switch. So you're going to have to stay on one side. Uh, and then if you want to just grab your drum um, to break up the energy for you a little bit, it's a lot of heavy information. Please feel free to do that. And we'll just take one minute and, um, and then we'll come back. Okay, I'm gonna welcome everyone back. Um, I did some pulling. <laughs> so hopefully you found something that worked for you. Um, next slide. Okay, so we've kind of been working up to this idea um, of Western intellectual property, but we'll talk a little bit more specifically about this now. Um, <clears throat> There are um, ways that uh, the Western uh, legal and academic system have really um, normalized um, theft and appropriation <clears throat> of our knowledge um, and also um, and use that knowledge to their own benefit, but at the same time that they have not recognized um, the authority of those people within our cultures and societies that actually hold that and have like the right um, to talk about it. 
And I think that's part of one of the most egregious things. We don't talk about that very much. Um, often we are very happy to uh, be part of projects that um, are for our benefit, that advance um, who we are. And so uh, we're getting better, we're getting savvier in terms of negotiating uh, better agreements and ensuring that there's benefits in partnerships for us. But we still have a long way to go and we still have a lot of changes that need to be made uh, to these systems. So just very um, generally and briefly, uh, most uh, universities have intellectual property. It's built into their standard contracts. Um, depending on the university, uh, they will be open or completely closed um, to the concept of putting in things that we would need to see uh, from a First Nations jurisdictional perspective. What does that include? That might include ensuring that we retain all ownership. That might be um, OCAP in terms of data. Um, it might be uh, talking about uh, how we are part of the process in agreements. Uh, and then, of course, legislation and policy, super long way to go there in terms of implementing UNDRIP across all acts that affect our rights, because um, we know that they impact them negatively in many ways. Um, I've kind of talked about this idea that our that our proper property owners are not recognized. It's not just that they're, they're not recognized, it's that they're not asked. And so in the community-based work that I've done <clears throat> with the teams that I've worked with, uh, we really want to be asking at the very outset, how do you want to be involved? You ensure that you ask permission and consent for anything that has to do with people's language. And um, <clears throat> we really need to come to terms with this idea that is fundamentally different between our collective societies and the individual Western society. And, um, and find ways that we're going to deal with what happened uh, with the Lakota people, which is that an individual can go out and uh, collect things that are not uh, their own, and then say back to that collective um, property owner, you need to pay me for this, you need to ask permission. It's so fundamentally egregious, and we have really a long way to go before we can get there. But that doesn't mean that we can't be advocating for changes in every project. Uh, but we do need those fundamental systems level changes um, to happen. Next slide. So um, the book is like a good example. <clears throat> so in the early days of anthropology, uh, we talked about um, the primacy, about um, the legitimacy of that individual anthropologist who was collecting knowledge. We didn't talk about um, those individuals. We know, we know their names. Uh, we know that um, there was uh, processes put in place to ensure that the, the knowledge was documented in the best way possible, but they didn't understand those cultures. So they weren't able to know what, all the time what was being said. We still work with those original anthropological, anthropological texts um, but we have to work with it in a way where we're validating it um, with our own people. Um, and we still have a long way to go before we can talk about uh, these changes that are needed to publishing generally. Next slide. So part of the work that I did with the um, International Journal for Indigenous Health was to really push for this collective um, this, this acknowledgement of collective ownership. Um, and so this paper here, I'm so proud of this work, the small part I had to play and the, you know, the part that many others played, um, this paper around a community-based, nation-based ethics review um, with the Cowichan tribes. Uh, this is an article about it, and it's the author is the Cowichan tribes. And so these are the kinds of things um, that we're trying to do. It's still obviously within a Western academic construct. Um, but we need to start acknowledging um, our rights to our knowledge and protecting them. Next slide. So I think we've kind of talked about this um, throughout. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. 
but I really wanted to draw your attention to um, the words of a lawyer who works very closely um, with Indigenous people um, when their rights um, are not recognized and um, are abused or minimized. And so here he's talking about <clears throat> um, he's talking about reconciliation and what a lot of people aren't aware of. Reconciliation is a term that comes from uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence, and what it what they were intending to talk about was how our rights had to be reconciled with this idea that there is um, underlying crown ownership, which of course um, from the Gitniao and the Gitsan we don't acknowledge underlying crown ownership of our territories um, and likely never will. So this idea that reconciliation um, is something that we can do um, walking hand in hand, there's a lot of truth that needs to come to light first and I'm not sure how that's going to look to be honest. And so he calls it very bluntly. He says reconciliation is a reconciliation of a right and a lie, the lie being um, crown authority over uh, Indigenous peoples and lands. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to tell a short story here. Um, <clears throat> I was part of this amazing project led by Dr. Janet Smiley um, and amazing Indigenous leaders and um, scholars across the country. And she called it the FIRE Network. So the fire, there's very specific teachings in um, other people's cultures. I'm, of course, from the West Coast, but I've spent time uh, with uh, Prairie and um, Central Canada nations. There's very specific teachings around the fire. And uh, it's also a place where we naturally storytell and connect um, and are equal with each other around the fire. And so it had a lot of um, resonance and meaning for us to be part of this. We were at a meeting right before COVID. <clears throat> and as I mentioned earlier, Mindy Denny was talking about um, a really harmful act that had happened. They had partnered with a researcher on a genetic study. Uh, the person who had been contracted to write a paper about it had uh, really no background knowledge uh, in indigenous history or health and um, had said some very damaging things. So this was not caught um, or anticipated at an ethics review stage. It was not caught at the peer review stage and it was not caught at the editorial stage. And so uh, it was caught <laughs> by the nation who they were speaking about once it was published. And so these kinds of ethical breaches, um, again, as I've mentioned, they are ongoing, just as the harms against our people in um, Canadian systems are ongoing. And so it was her who uh, really is um, the force and the inspiration behind the work that Janet and Leona Starr and I did um, following that. And so Janet Smiley had negotiated this space to work with the Canadian Journal of Public Health, uh, and we collectively decided to go for it and to bring um, our rights and our voice and authority into that process. Next slide. So um, <clears throat> there's a new policy uh, with this journal. Very, very simply, it's that you can't write about um, people unless you have someone um, also as a co-author. This is not to encourage people to rush out and grab someone to validate their work and to put their name on it. This is meant to be like the last stage. We should be not, we should be catching these issues much earlier, even before the ethics review. We still have issues with that. This is the final stage of the work. Um, there should not be um, things that are going out there that are identifying nations, peoples that have no, um, no one from that nation or people also um, part of the process and ensuring that it's done respectfully and not done from like a racist and discriminatory and stigmatizing place. So that's kind of the story behind this policy. Um, and I, I <sighs> this work is very interesting to me because um, 
I'm I'm grateful that I'm personally elevated by this work, but I also I wanted to share the background to that because it's really for everybody. It's meant to empower um, those people who are partnered so that they have voice, um, and that's really the intent of all of this. Next slide. Uh, so very quickly, the seven directives, if you don't know about it and you're in BC, or if you're interested in it and you're from another um, territory in uh, what's now known as Canada, uh, this is a really significant piece of work. It was done through consensus building with First Nations in BC. It's a directive that's given to the First Nations Health Authority on the expectations that they expect to see and how um, that mandate is carried out on their behalf. I also have an example of a nation-based research ethics guidelines that was shared uh, at a meeting I was at um, recently. So we have a long way to go to bring this work into ethics review, very long way to go, um, but I'm very excited to be part of um, those first steps. Next slide. Okay, so we've kind of talked a little bit about this um, going through, so I just wanted to bring this all together for you. Um, Part of the work that I did uh, when we moved the Journal for Aboriginal Health from what was NAHO, the National Aboriginal Health Organization, we moved it to the University of Victoria. We had um, we had edit editorial direction provided by uh, the Indigenous researchers as part of the Aboriginal Health Research Network Secretariat, which was a national network of um, university-based centers that had Indigenous governance and that provided full scholarships to First Nations Indigenous students. It was a very significant, um, that network and the NEARS um, that were started by the Institute for then Aboriginal People's Health, now Indigenous People's Health, was a significant intervention because it created a huge um, new generation of Indigenous scholars um, that bring their cultures and ways of knowing and their own um, standards um, into, into universities. So collective authorship, um, something that we had expressed uh, for the first um, time, but very like very clearly, we invited that and welcomed it. Uh, we also required authors to demonstrate that they met any community or nation-based ethics standards. Uh, we also asked them to talk about their relationship to the community and Indigenous populations, in, in particular, if it was a non-Indigenous uh, lead author. Uh, or principal investigator. Uh, one of the two peer reviewers was always Indigenous and community-based uh, and preferably had uh, knowledge of that community or nation or um, content area. Also really welcome students and promising practice submissions. Uh, we invited video submissions. I think this is an area of uh, fertility <laughs> for like this young generation. I think we can start to be more creative in conceptualizing how we share knowledge. Uh, if you have uh, young children in your life, you know that TikTok is like this really just huge thing and uh, all kinds of beautiful messages are shared, some not so beautiful, but um, I think there's um, a lot of potential there in terms of how we can engage young people in sharing our knowledge and um, our teachings um, with each other. And then we also had an initial editorial review fit, and uh, that was done by First Nations Indigenous um, Managing Editor and Editor. Next slide. And just to note, we did screen some people out. If it was, if it looked unethical, we did screen them out. <clears throat> um, so the reason you're here today, we're finally there. Uh, really excited about this um, double edition, double volume. I know I'm saying it wrong, but we had we had so many submissions. We were so blessed with all of um, the great work that was done uh, that we had to split it into two. It was just too much. Um, and so that's what happened. Uh, just very briefly, uh, we created a design that would really um, enhance and support First Nations Indigenous leadership in the editorial process. Uh, we had capacity building for the research team. So these were non-Indigenous allied researchers um, and support staff where they learned about what we were, we were doing. We walked through a review of, um, uh, of submissions. And so they learned what we were looking for in terms of like what would be acceptable, what's not acceptable. 
We had, um, of course, um, Dr. Evan Adams and Sonia Isaacman as our two uh, FNHA based editors. And then we also engaged Dr. Ted Mal, who I personally just loved working with, and I know everybody else loved working with him too. Um, and so those editors reviewed all the decisions. And um, we also very specifically wanted to work with um, Dr. Ted Mala so that we could have a separate process because we had so many, and that's what we wanted. Our leadership wanted to have many FNHA led submissions to talk about the work that's happened since um, the organization's been created. And so we had to have a separate process to ensure that there was no conflict of interest, that we were having a high standard of review. And so um, he oversaw that. And uh, I'm really excited that you're going to get to hear from them today, too. Next slide. So just to summarize um, <clears throat> what we've talked about, we have a current state where we're not in rights recognition. Uh, and we also are in a context of uh, racism in Canadian society. So our research agreements um, often still assert the ownership um, of the institution. We don't have um, competent Indigenous ethics review. Uh, we did some really groundbreaking work um, a few years ago to ensure that the First Nations Health Authority was part of the harmonized ethics review process in BC so that wherever they were partnered, that they would receive um, that ethics submission and they would provide um, ethical and like Indigenous and First Nations based feedback. That's very important. Um, I cannot state how important this is um, as an intervention because researchers do not think that they have to run their ethics application um, by their partners. That's changing. Um, but we have a lot of uh, principles and um, guidelines around this, but they're just not being applied. Um, and then also we still need to have uh, an Indigenous uh, Ethics Review Board of Record here in BC. Um, I know that some people have said that, you know, this could be a reconciliation based model. We could have all of the universities contributing to fund that Board of Record for Indigenous research. I think it's needed. Uh, I don't think that institutions, um, for the most part, can do it on their own, although some are doing much better uh, than others in terms of working very closely with their Indigenous expertise and being grounded in the nation that they're hosted on and working in partnership with other nations. But again, um, I don't see a lot of like uh, well-developed models for that. So this is one, one potential approach. We don't have uh, federal funding, <clears throat> to my knowledge for Indigenous publishing um, that's grounded in, in Indigenous knowledge. There's been a couple journals um, that were started and are now being maintained, but they're doing it through small grants. Um, when I managed the um, <clears throat> when I managed the International Journal for Indigenous Health, uh, I did it off the side of my desk. We didn't have any core funding for it. Uh, there was an amazing um, journal um, that was done in partnership in the international indigenous community. That journal was moved outside of Canada. There's just no funding. So this is like a really critical issue for us. Um, it goes to the heart of our indigenous knowledge and its protection, and especially um, for indigenous led work, which it really does need to be indigenous and First Nations led. Um, something I'd like to see, and I'm working to do this, um, to support this at UBC if I can. So having community approval, um, for graduate and PhD Indigenous partnered research. I think we need to start seeing this. If you're working closely with one nation, uh, that nation should be approving the project before it gets to um, the university committee. Uh, that would be a recognition of their jurisdiction. We really wanted to talk about data governance, data sovereignty. It's a massive topic. It's um, a really critical topic right now. We've got federal data management guidelines that are going to be implemented soon. Uh, we don't have a lot of clear guidance to research ethics boards on what that means. We know that there will be a requirement for agreements or sorry, uh, data management plans that will get reviewed by ethics boards. How they will be looked at when there's indigenous partner, how they will be looked at where there's more than one nation involved. All of that stuff is not um, known. And so again, institutions need guidance or we need more clear jurisdiction um, that's reflected in processes of indigenous people and their rights and knowledge. 
Next slide. And then just to summarize, um, <clears throat> I think we've said this already. <laughs> I don't want to be the dead horse, but we do need to fund Indigenous publishers. Um, we need to prioritize indig Indigenous authorship and Indigenous publications. Um, more significantly, we need more core funding for nations and communities to engage in research, um, to participate in peer review, to be paid for that time, uh, to be acknowledged for their contributions, to create and manage their own ethics and approval processes um, in their community or nation. Um, just want to pause here for a, sec a, sec a second. Um, so we when we um, when we were under um, the conservative government, I, I can't remember how many years ago, what we saw was a very targeted defunding of um, umbrella organizations, tribal councils, um, these, these organizations that really brought together, uh, the ability for us to do work, um, more strategically. And so I don't know where we're at with that funding. I don't know if we've like gone back to those, um, pre-levels, um, prior to that, but the core funding is not just for these processes specifically, the core funding is for our people so that we can start to think about how we want to do this work. Um, so we need much more bigger core funding bases, and then we also need the very specific funding to engage in this work in a way that is meaningful for us, that is grounded in who we are, that is grounded in our rights. Um, I say abolish here, I, I really do believe this. Um, intellectual property, Western intel intellectual property regimes really have no business um, asserting or claiming uh, or trying to um, gain financial advantage off of our knowledge. It's It needs to just die off. It needs to be a thing of the past. Um, and we need Indigenous governance um, at the highest levels in university, um, not just partnered on projects. We need to be part of setting the priorities and making those decisions um, at a higher level so that it trickles down and we don't see these um, harms ongoing. And then, of course, creating administrative processes the fun part of creating documents, agreements. <laughs> um, for people who love this stuff, you know that um, you have to be a very creative person to do this kind of work. And then, of course, the bigger societal needs for ensuring legal regulatory regimes that protect our knowledge and that are moving away from this very ingrained idea of the Western individual uh, rights holder um, and also the ability to appropriate um, and take Indigenous knowledge. So we need uh, more protections against that. And then I spoke to this earlier. So just having more delegated reviews and approvals of students, projects, and partnerships. Um, universities uh, can be part of this. They can acknowledge the jurisdiction and authority um, that's outside um, their university walls, but we still, again, need that capacity and funding to be able to do that. I think communities are ready to do this, uh, but we need funding and support. Next slide. Okay, <laughs> so um, I'm really fortunate. To, um, my friend and colleague, uh, Janine Erickson, is always reminding us so what? Okay, all of this, what are we going to do? So I have this here. Um, I'm not very good at this yet, so please, you know, have some patience with me. Um, really just around, this is thinking about taking a step back um, from, you know, everything that I've just um, gone over with you. How will you move forward with resolve to full recognition of Indigenous rights? How will you implement this in your work? How will you challenge systems to change? And how will you um, speak up when those um, rights abuses um, are taking place? Racism will, will not end without Canadians, white settlers taking on that responsibility. It's not our responsibility to teach how to do that. We can guide, but that's really in the hands um, of those who benefit from the system of oppression. So depending on where you sit with that, um, please think about it through that lens. Uh, if you have a Canadian perspective, please don't jump to wanting to protect Indigenous rights. We need to be supporting 
our people to do that and they need to be in charge and leading and speaking so think about that framework a little bit leading following um and where you sit appropriately in that next slide oh okay i'm just going to check in with katie here so we wanted to just uh take a moment to go back to these original things that you were interested in um would you like to still do this katie yeah okay so uh feel free to annotate again and just reflect if that's what works for you um if your thoughts have changed um throughout the talk um we of course are always changing we're um our core of who we are is the same but we are ever changing and we're never the same person so feel free to um yeah pick something different or share your thoughts in the chat if you've had some bright lights please share with each other um, that's why we're here I am seeing some subtle shifts and I'm seeing them, you know, more to like the grounding um, and the rights and the models. That's really cool and exciting. Um, that's a that's a movement. I like it. This is wonderful. So um, I'll let Katie decide how long she wants to keep this up. Thank you so much. Um, the last slide is just my thank you. Um, I really do appreciate each and every one of you, um, your your presence physically, um, uh, emotionally, uh, mentally, and spiritually. And um, I really encourage you to go forth and uh, to do this work in a good way, um, to do it in humility, and uh, to support um, our First Nations Indigenous leaders uh, to stand in their authority. Uh, and to change those systems. It needs all of us to do this work um, and it needs to happen soon <laughs> in our lifetimes um, so that we don't continue to perpetuate this for our children. Thank you. Hamia. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Namaste. That was such a good presentation and uh, so inspiring and something that I will share within my new um, journey is that uh, Namaste did have a massive impact on the research and knowledge exchange uh, team with FNHA. And so I, I've had such a um, feeling of honor and privilege to hear some of your perspectives um, and how I can apply them in the work that I do. Um, and especially loved listening to, uh, you know, your, your comments about leaving the world a better place and how, you know, everything that we do has an impact for the next seven generations. So really wanting to raise my hands to you. So we do have uh, questions coming in. And so uh, if I can present them to you and, and give you the floor again, I think there's a lot of eager people wanting to hear more. So the first question is, have there been any movement or steps taken at or by the university? universities towards Indigenous intellectual property protection, are conversations beginning to happen? I think you've talked a little bit about this, but if you have anything more to say. Yes. Um, so I don't know if I can give you a good answer to that, but I will just say um, the shift that I have um, talked about here um, that we're, we're doing in Indigenous knowledge in publishing in Canada and internationally 
uh, and also in BC around shifting um, to authority and jurisdiction to First Nations, that shift needs to happen um, in terms of property. We're looking at terms that are grounded in um, legal traditions that are from England. <laughs> the common law comes from England. It has no connection to our lands, to our history, uh, and to our inherent rights. And so we need to be starting from a place where we're starting from our own concepts, our own laws, um, and protecting things from that place. Uh, we get into trouble when we um, rely on um, the concept, um, the concepts that are in Western law, because they're not um, they're alien, they're alien to the lands, to our territories. And so we have to be very, very careful about how we talk about protecting knowledge. Um, we do um, copyright and uh, register trademarks. I feel like we often do that in a state of duress because of the uh, real threats of appropriation and theft. I don't necessarily think that those are what we would choose if we had um, uh, systems of protection that were grounded in our own values and our own cultures and our own language. Um, so just again, to reiterate, we need to be starting those conversations from our own values and our own legal systems. Thank you. Another question we have is um, wondering what you think about the idea of two-eyed seeing and if it might be helpful or harmful in lifting up Indigenous voices. Well, <laughs> um, part of being at your midlife point is that you start looking towards the younger generation to see um, their ideas and their passion and how they're going to move past like where we've taken um, and how we've tried to create a space for them um, to come in. I would say that two-eyed seeing is a really um, good reflection in terms of um, where we've been federally, um, in terms of working to bring Indigenous people into the research process. Um, the Institute for Aboriginal People's Health, if you've ever uh, heard Jeff Redding talk about um, the story about that, it was touch and go. Um, it was a political process. There was a lot of advocacy. Um, we're often doing that. We're often lobbying for our advances, despite all the evidence um, that clearly states toward um, what we need to have in place. And so um, I would say that that's an accurate um, concept that we're that we're working with. We're trying to look at how we can do work that creates knowledge that will benefit our people, that has, um, you know, the best of Western skill sets and methods. Uh, and also a foundation of our knowledge and our value system. But as you can see, um, there are uh, Indigenous um, graduate and doctoral students and community-based researchers who are grounding their work, again, in their own culture and in Indigenous methods. And that is like really beautiful. And I really think we need to raise up that work. And in this uh, these special editions, that's what we really wanted to see was um, how far can we uh, encourage people to base their work grounded uh, in who they are? And so to answer that question simply, I hope that we uh, move forward and uh, we only take what is needed. We talk about medicine bundles and sharing with each other. You take what you need and you leave uh, the rest. I think we need to be very selective about what we take um, from Western frameworks and approaches. And if it does not fit, we just leave it there. Thank you very much. Namaste. It's um, so true in so many things that you're saying. And um, I can even say in my own journey and, and education and things that you're saying, I'm like, oh, yes, this is perfect for my pocket. So I'm also um, very much uh, collecting what I need today and, and appreciate the space for that. Um, so at this time, we have a couple more questions. Oh, um, we've got one that just came in. Um, wondering what your thoughts uh, are, are on individuals who, who have been called out in media platforms for identifying as Indigenous but are not, supposedly. Thank you for your grace and understanding, uh, or excuse me, your grace, and I'm trying to understand how to approach these articles. So 
Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't address that that trend specifically. I did try and talk about it in terms of knowledge, um, but the same the same kinds of things we see happening in terms of a gold rush and appropriation and theft, we are seeing that in the realm of our identity and who we are. I don't see that when I look at what happened um, in the early colonization period with anthropologists, with art collectors going out and just rapidly gathering and taking, um, I don't see that as different, to be honest. Um, I see identity as like yet one more thing. I don't see it as like more important than the rest. And I, I see a pattern um, and approach that, that supports that. So really what I wanted to do today was to talk about um, that imperative that is really grounded in the Western colonization enterprise and to go at the source. Um, it doesn't make um, what happens in terms of um, asserting an identity that's not yours, it doesn't make it okay. It actually does bring it into the realm of fraud. Um, and I think we may see um, more developments around that. Um, but again, uh, as was shown in the, in the Lakota case, um, it always takes um, our people to bring those actions forward, unfortunately. Um, I'd like to see um, a different time period in the future where um, those uh, challenges can be taken on um, by allies so that we don't have to do all the work because we are so busy. Um, and so the intent is really to talk about these things openly so that other people um, can help shoulder, shoulder the burden of this. Thank you. And oh. Oh, yeah. So Elena is just saying thank you. Um, and that brings us to pretty well perfect timing um, for your presentation. And so just wanting to um, thank you very deeply, Heichka, uh, um, and uh, just wanting to share the Hulhaminum term, Kwam Kwam Slaney. So a very strong, powerful woman um, that, that's, uh, that you and your attributes today have been so powerful um, in helping us uh, walk together in how it is that we can do things in a better way. So um, it, it's, uh, we have so much gratitude for you uh, presenting today and sharing and bringing everything about you into your presentation. So thank you very much. And um, at this time, we'll we'll grant everybody the extra break or the extra time that you had alluded to earlier. So um, uh, we'll take a 15 minute break. We do have a couple of shifts in our um, day, which is great. Everything goes exactly the way it's supposed to go. Um, but uh, one of our guests is um, is uh, having some difficulties tuning in. So we'll be uh, uh, troubleshooting that over the break, but please uh, take the time that you need, step outside, grab a drink, have a bio break, and um, we will reconvene at 11 o'clock. Hi, Tsepka. Great, thank you right. and welcoming everybody back. And um, especially welcoming Dr. Ted Mella. We're so happy that it's worked out and that you're here. Um, and we're so excited to have you today. So you look great. We can see you, we can hear you, and we're really grateful to share the space with you. Um, so welcome. Uh, and we are um, excited to invite you and to welcome you to the Circling Together for Wellness uh, virtual, virtual gathering. You. So I'll very briefly introduce uh, Dr. Ted Milla, and then we will, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Um, so Dr. Ted Mala is the former South Central Foundation Director of Traditional Healing and Tribal Relations at the Alaska Native Medical Center in Anchorage, Alaska. Originally from Buckland in Northwest Al West Alaska, Dr. Mala was the first Alaska Native doctor to return to the state to serve Alaska Native people. He was also the first Alaska Native to serve as the state's commissioner of the Department of Health and Social Services. Drawing on his Inupiat Eskimo background, Dr. Mala served as a bridge between the Western medicine physicians and tribal practitioners. Dr. Mala is retired from medicine after practicing for more than 40 years. Um, so we'll, we'll have an opportunity to work 
uh, with our guest until about 1130 and that's when we'll go to a breakout room. So over to you, Dr. Mala. Great, thank you. And thank you everyone for um, inviting me. This is a great honor for me to be able to work with our brothers and sisters in Canada. And it doesn't happen as much as it should. And so it, it makes us feel really close to you. I guess I want to talk first a little bit about my background. Um, yes, I, I've done all those things. Um, I'm old. <laughs> I'm 76. So I must have done something right or wrong. I'm not sure. But somehow uh, we are uh, where we are today. Uh, I grew up, my parents died when I was six and seven. And uh, I was uh, put in boarding school. So that's how my life began. It was a little bit traumatic. Um, and I was in that for uh, about eight years. Um, and then after that, I took the course of beginning to study and learning something about medicine and trying to just figure out how to help people. I think I was motivated my father because he died of rheumatic heart disease and we had a very big epidemic in the early days where lots of our families got rheumatic disease, uh, rheumatic heart disease, and he died of a mitral insufficiency, which most of you know, is his heart valve gave out. So um, then my mother died a year later, and I'm sure she died of a broken heart. That's what people do. And so I was an only child and somehow uh, landed up in boarding school because social workers felt that was the best thing. And it's just amazing what people did in the 50s um, in the name of society and God. But you all know that story very well, too. And somehow we've survived and I've lived this long to um, see another day. Um, we're also coming to Vancouver, by the way, for Pride Ox. So if you are uh, coming to Pride Ox, please look us up. Uh, my wife, Dr. Mao, and I will be there. And uh, we would really look forward to meeting you. So life takes us on an interesting journey, all of us. It's fascinating for me to see how people land up where they have, and we are all a collection of our own um, experiences. Part of my experiences, yes, were working in research, and I worked at the National Institutes of Health in Washington, D.C., actually in Bethesda, Maryland, and uh, I was on a number of committees that would actually judge grants and help decide who should get funded and who should not. Um, and that was kind of my qualification to come into this. Dr. Uh, Evan Adam is also, um, was, was also a good friend and, and he knew that I was working with NIH and he invited me to be a co-editor on uh, this incredible journal, journal that we turned out. Uh, I really enjoyed it because it was a great collection of people from urban and rural areas. I think it's really important to train as many people as possible to um, learn how to do good medical research to inform decisions uh, of what um, what policy things should happen. Unfortunately, uh, public health has turned very political, at least in this country, uh, but hopefully that will swing back and a more sane mind will uh, work towards more reasoning. We um, enjoyed especially working with Vancouver and, and the Yukon uh, because we're next door to each other. We find sometimes the geopolitical lines that people draw 
not very compatible. We consider ourselves very related to all of you. And it's just amazing sometimes where uh, the geopolitical lines actually try to define people that um, they want to happen. You're a Canadian, you're an American, you're a Russian. Uh, I worked in Siberia for a while with NIH and we, as we got there and started working with people, we found out what a lie the, was about um, the Cold War. That's when I was working there in the Cold War. And we were all very related. And the politics of one country versus another uh, didn't play much of a big role at the time because we were all native and we came together and uh, just did the right thing for the majority of people. We were mostly working on subjects like tuberculosis, like cold uh, adaptation to the cold and the countries that, uh, and the people that come up to the North and how they adapt and how they work. Um, we worked a lot on circadian rhythm and how people make decisions and live in the North. It was very interesting to see how long it would take for people to adapt and to fully adapt, we felt, was around seven years. Dr. Kuznetsov of the Russian Academy of Medical Sciences was one of the leaders in this area, as well as uh, a number of people from the Northern Medical Unit in Manitoba and uh, us in Anchorage um, and Scandinavia, the Nordic Council. So I, I found myself very interested in things that are unique to the North. And when I read the journal of, of we were working on uh, together, it was really nice to see the problems people had presented in terms of uh, working in, in small communities and um, how we use subsistence and how to keep it healthy and what we need to keep going. And also that... Um, the wonderful part is that people were starting to train us to um, continue. One of the things I, I really wanted to do was that if somebody got a grant from the government, part of that grant should include training, uh, mentoring. Uh, a lot of people forget that, but it's really important because how are we gonna uh, protect and get the next generation ready? We say that we walk in two worlds with one spirit. And one of the tools of adaptation that we have to work with is to make good informed public health decisions that include um, all the things that are really important for native people, as well as uh, the population in general. Um, I have about 20 different ways I can go with this, but I was going to stop and I, I thank Kate for all her patience with me, but I really want to ask if anyone has any comments or questions uh, so that we can interact. I, I, I really enjoy two-way things, not one way. <laughs> so let me stop for a second and hopefully um, we'll hear some comments either on the journal or where research should be going in the future or whatever you think. No, I don't hear anything on my end, but. Maybe I can start us off here, Ted. Um, I'm, what you said about kind of what the future is looking like, I am curious how you feel Indigenous health research is going to change in 5, 10, 25 years? Like, what will that look like in your perspective? Well, I lived 76 years, and I was on a committee 
for research review at the public health service at the Native Hospital. Back in 1975, I was helping represent the Native Health Board, and it's changed a lot. I think what's really important is that tribes and Native people need to understand what an IRB is, and um, because you need to control your own research. Uh, there are a lot of people that have made their name on Native people uh, doing their own research, and then we never heard from them again. Uh, I personally think that it's really critical that Native people control the research, decides what kind of research should be done, and review it before it's exposed to the world. And many years ago, we had a particular community. It was very prominent uh, that a researcher came up and made his name on. And basically, the next day, we heard on the radio nationally that this was like one of the places where the most drunk people in Alaska were. And we had no say over the um, over the type of research and what they did was uh, made their name on it uh, on people and yet they had to live with problems with not only alcoholism but suicide. Yes, they do exist, but people should have some kind of um, input as to what we're going to project to the world. We're, are we only going to talk about the errors and the problems that our people have are we actually going to suggest something positive to do and not give our villages, especially a, a bad name um, where it's not totally deserved? There's a lot of constructive things that could be done in the findings of research uh, that a review board needs to talk to researchers about and educate them something about what is a community, who are the people that live there, and establish a mutual bond of trust between the two. Thank you for that. Well, I'll keep going if I don't hear anything. <laughs> um, so the idea then is to figure out how to teach people how to do research, how to jo uh, establish a joint mutual trust between people. We need people to, from government as well as non-government, to come forward and learn not only what is research, how to judge research, and how to come out with a positive um, change effort at the end of it. Uh, what is the role of elders? What are the role of people that go and come in a community unknowing anything about perhaps Canada or your villages or your how decisions are made? There needs to be an orientation uh, for people before we allow them to come in to our communities. Uh, many years ago, actually in, in the 20s, uh, my father was a movie star. He's the first Alaska Native movie star. And he f starred in a film called Eskimo. And there's a book called Eskimo Star about his life, how he went from a village to Hollywood. And these were some of the first talkies that were ever made. And the film won an Oscar. Uh, Eskimo did. Actually, it's on Amazon. I'm shamelessly telling you, we don't get any money for it, but uh, it, it it was amazing because the film showed traditional hunting and won the first Academy Award for um, film, film editing. But they took a boat and they went up to uh, Nome and that area and froze the boat in and just started filming uh, hunting seasons of polar bears and walruses and you name it, everything that we have, caribou. Well, anyway, the Indian Health Service, which provides health care for us, um, 
showed that movie every single year for many, many years to show young researchers and doctors and healthcare workers uh, something about Alaska Natives and how we live and, and how we survive. Uh, it's those kinds of things that really need to happen. Uh, it would be great if people could make a film or start an orientation for a particular area. Every community is different, though, and we have over 200 native villages, and each one is really different. Uh, we have our own uh, special lifestyle. Uh, we have different languages. We have different customs. And you really need to make some kind of program on every single every single village to show people before they go in what should happen. How do you do research? Um, some people that were trained in the city felt that, well, the only way was to um, mail in a result. And another one was to go door to door and another one. And, and by the way, at least in Alaska, people do best face to face and not being mailed or, or expect people to use a, a computer questionnaire. Uh, what we did when I was the minister of health of Alaska, when we had surveys of different kinds, we would pay people to fill it out. And we would also pay someone from each village. We would train them to go from door to door and ask questions that were sensitive. Um, but the important thing was not only gathering the data, but bringing the data back to people and explaining what we found. And of course, uh, what's really important also is to uh, mask the data so that when it comes out, maybe the name of the village was anonymous but uh, somehow it would, would uh, play a role in decisions that are made or in new healthcare programs or whatever you want to call it. Research was always a difficult problem for Alaska and for rural areas. Uh, we often used to say, uh, what's the typical native family? And we would say a mother and a father, two children and uh, one or two researchers. And we really believe that because we were the subject of everything. We were either uh, subject to research or to religion or to another of uh, political kinds of things that would people come. There was always somebody ready to save us, but we really didn't need to be saved, um, maybe from just the people coming in, but it's so very, very important to train people to understand uh, and not use the data in a hurtful way. So as we begin to um, teach the world about our people, uh, when I went to public health school, I was the first Alaskan native to uh, go to Harvard, and we went to the Harvard School of Public Health, and I always thought, well, these are people geniuses. There's nothing I can really tell them, but it turns out I was spending uh, some free time uh, giving lectures on Alaska. Uh, most of their experience was in, in the tropical areas, and we needed, they needed information on um, the north. It was amazing how few people actually understand the North. Uh, in Canada, the uh, medical unit at uh, Manitoba was the leader for a long, long time. And we work with them in our circumpolar health. We actually started the International Union of Circumpolar Health, which you're not aware of, you should be. Um, what we did was we looked at the a globe and we took the globe and looked at it from the top, looking down. And we looked at what countries were there, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Greenland, Norway, Canada, Alaska, Russia. Um, and we brought all these countries together and we did a meeting every year, which well, not actually every year, every couple of years, 
that was called the International Union of Circumpolar Health. You can Google that, I-U-C-H. And the idea was to bring Northerners together and talk about unique problems that we have. And we published the journal, uh, a great big journal uh, that you will find in your medical library of the proceedings of the International Union. And in in these proceedings, you can read about how each country has identified specific problems, be they in mental health, or it could be in physical health, or in cold adaptation, or all these things. It's a fascinating compendium of his medical history in Alaska and all the other countries. Um, I think, again, it's really important to visualize the Northern world as one. Um, when we think about circumpolar health, we think about birds, we think about mammals, we think about fish, and none of them stop at the human-created borders. It's uh, humans that, <laughs> that somehow have made all these borders. And the idea is to follow their migrations and see how they adapt to the north. When we had this problem over Chernobyl, uh, one of the main monitoring ways was the Arctic ice uh, and how things um, would land up in the water and affect marine mammals. And that's one of the ways we monitored everything to uh, find out if there was going to be some damage uh, to humans living in the north. Our life is changing. Uh, climate is changing. Um, many things are changing, and it's a very fertile ground right now for people, especially young people, to get interested in it and do something for the whole planet that that's really um, helpful. We also look at, in the north, of collecting plants, medicinal plants. Traditional healing is very much alive in Alaska. We um, were able to actually put it into our clinic. Uh, we made a clinic for traditional healing, and we put the doctors on an equal footing as the medical doctors, the Western doctors, and we have rounds where people come together and discuss different uh, approaches to working with Native people. Traditional healing is very, very important especially in the area of mental health. We've had patients that um, were at the state psychiatric hospital that were from a village and native. And I can think of a girl, especially a young girl, that was forcibly put into the psychiatric unit and did not talk for two weeks. And they called us and said, do you have any ideas? And we brought her over and brought her into our clinic where our traditional healers would uh, give her some fish and maybe some seal oil and some tea. Um, And all of a sudden she started opening up and crying and and wouldn't stop talking the whole time. Uh, We see this time after time again. Um, There has to be a wonderful role for both. Go ahead. I don't know if you heard me, but. Might have been an accident, um, but please continue, Dad. Oh, sorry. I just want to underscore before we finish that there is an incredible role for traditional healers and Western uh, practitioners to come together and discuss uh, patients and medical care. Uh, We've seen some incredible reversals on suicide prevention, on drug interaction, on um, all kinds of things. And, and we were not considered a part of mental health, but actually the back door to mental health. And these are things we could talk about very easily another day. Um, but it's been so successful. And we've talked to neurologists and neurosurgeons about arthritis and 
ways to uh, massage that were handed down for thousands of years, and they were used in touch with uh, our medical practitioners, and the results have been incredible. And uh, a number of things we have used uh, actually have been uh, drug-free. They often, our patients always say, well, I went to mental health, and um, explained my problem, and all they did was drug me, <laughs> and that didn't help. They said, my head's fuzzy, but the problem's still there, and so it's those kinds of things that we need to explore and talk about, um, because there's a lot of wisdom, both traditionally and in the Western world. Uh, we also have an association of American Indian physicians, uh, which also advocates a lot with the Canadian indigenous physicians. Um, And we come together at times and talk about traditional healing and bring traditional healers together and talk about bridging that gap. It's another area that I really suggest, and I would hope that future journals and things we do would uh, begin to stress that more uh, instead of just the uh, automatic uh, reflex reaction of, of putting someone on drugs. See, we have about one minute. Any last comments? So Dr. Mala, we had one clarifying question. Um, what was the name of the clinic? Uh, the traditional hailing clinic? Yeah, the, the, I think they're that's, asking the one with the, the similar um, compensation model as oh, doctors yeah, and that's, healers. Yeah, that's at the Alaska Native Medical Center. It's in the uh, PCC, Primary Care Building, and it's called the Traditional Healing Clinic. And it has a spot right in the entrance of the building uh, where people can't miss it uh, and a place of great honor. And uh, our traditional healers are certified by a council of elders that uh, we established to uh, oversee things. And we think it's extremely important to engage elders in whatever we do. And that has really uh, brought a lot of people, both in religions and in medicine and in all kinds of areas. It's diffused a lot of criticism and has been widely accepted by people. Of course, you have to be careful who you choose as your elders and so on, but it's very doable. And we always invite people to come and visit um, and discuss it. That's amazing. Thank you so much for the presentation. And I will just say that we've had a number of comments and, uh, and um, applause coming in and, and um, a hunger for your slides and learning more. So um, this has been a really stimulating uh, presentation and wanting to say hi for all the work that you've uh, spearheaded. It's amazing to hear you speak and, and understand um, some of the beautiful connections that are so important to our, um, our health. So thank, well, thank you, you for thinking much. of us. Thank you. And, and, and thank you everyone for tolerating me for half an hour. And many of us will have the privilege of meeting you in a couple of weeks at the pre-doc. So um, uh, we look forward to it and we can give you our connections and how to find us and how we keep this movement going because everything that we've done, most things have not worked. So isn't that the definition of insanity? We kept doing the same things the same way and not doing it a different way. And that's my challenge to all of you. Thank you very much, Heichka, Dr. Mala. Very inspiring. the parallels that I see echoed in my own work. Um, Because these institutional or colonial frameworks get replicated across, whether it's academia or it's business, um, 
as a freelance graphic recorder and artist, as a person who um, my practice is um, being a witness to information and then sharing that back. Um, yeah, I've gone through my own journey with, I previously had um, a white professional who was a mentor to me, who I deeply looked up to, um, whose ways of being had a lot of ownership ingrained in business practices such as um, non-compete clauses in um, contracts and asserting ownership over Indigenous clients. Um, and so these are just examples of ways that this work resonates across so many different spaces and why it's important to um, connect to the deeper lesson and also connect to the feeling of like the voices that we're centering and how this work can be applied in different spaces. And so I do wanna thank you for inviting me to record this important work and create a visual for you to carry forward. Um, yeah, and with that, let me take a breath because I just spoke a lot. Um, does anyone have any questions, um, comments? Um, you're welcome to write something in the chat. Uh, you're welcome to speak it into the room if there's anything that is feeling particularly alive for you. Um, Tiara, uh, Don, uh, I was in a different uh, room there earlier talking about weaving and the way that you wove your story around your, how you created is fantastic. I just really appreciate that way of doing it. So the, you were able to encapsulate what, what was presented all the way through the, all the way through the sessions today and just I'm grateful for that. That's just to realize that just, you know, the different cultures that throw, flow through your bloodlines is represented in here and uh, you're very, very rich. And uh, the more culture we have in us from around the, the earth, the richer we are. And just wanna thank you for sharing what you have and taking the courage to bring that forward in the way that you do. It's uh, risk taking is always uh, so vital and so important. I just appreciate that about you right now. So thanks. Thank you so much for sharing that, Don. I think that in this work, I'm in so many amazing conversations where these themes are repeated again and again. And I find that often what we need is the courage to connect with each other. Like when you feel that, like, oh, something is off. I, I wanna say something like noticing, um, you know, a lot of these questions around like, oh, whose voice should we be listening to? And are we defaulting to one person in charge who, um, you know, holds an institutional power as the authority? And are there ways, as Namaste was saying, um, that we can value our collective knowledge? So that means looking around you and saying, hey, am I talking to the other, am I talking to the other people with experiences who, have lived experiences of what we're talking about here. And um, yeah. It reminds me of another elder talking about policy making. And um, I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting who, what her exact name is right now. I can see her face in my mind and she was saying, you know, policy doesn't start with looking in colonial books or what you read in a in a legal framework. It, it starts with you and me. It starts with our relationships to each other and knowing where we're rooted and knowing how we can be of better service to the land and each other.
Tiare, thank you so All much. Right. I just want to point out there's a, a lot of activity in the chat, um, compliments and good points. And I just wanted to point that out. I, I think you captured it really beautifully. I love the colors. I think it captures a lot of the spirit of what Namaste was saying. And I can feel almost like the heat of the conversation from the fire and the suns. And I just really appreciate that. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much, uh, Tiari, for your beautiful work. Um, you've done such a nice job capturing our day. And like our elders said, um, so much of yourself shines through this and it's such a beautiful um, piece of that work. So really wanting to raise my hands to you. Um, and I think that you've done such a beautiful job of polishing our day by demonstrating that everything that we do is deeply personal and our way of understanding and uh, what knowledge exchange really is, is so much a part of everything that we are and the generations before us. So that's what I'm taking away today is um, how, how personal our work amongst our people is and the work of a circle, even if it's virtual, has such a deep impact on us and the generations before us. So I thank you so much for um, tying our day together in such a powerful way. And as we move into our last piece of the day, um, and, uh, you know, are all walking away with things that will impact us differently today, tomorrow, and for the rest of our lives. Um, I would invite at this time our elder who opened us in such a good way to close us and guide us with any intentions that we might um, be gifted with as we move into the rest of our afternoon. So at this time, um, thank you so much. Uh, for the group, uh, your participation, your presence, your support, and a huge thank you to Katie, um, Matthew, Ashley, and our SFU partners for the amount of work that's gone into today. Um, I have so much gratitude for um, uh, uh, how beautifully this has come together. So Haït Sepka, all my relations, and um, at this time, Elder uh, Don Beecham, thank you so much. Okay, everybody. So again, the way we began, we just put our feet flat, flat on the floor and lead, lead you off with the song and hope for a safe journey home for everybody. And uh, you take forward today, what we learned today, just, uh, just for myself, uh, just deep gratitude. I know that the future look is looking really bright. I'm just so grateful to be part of this process today. And I've learned a lot today. So I'm gonna go and digest that and uh, just send you on your way with a, a song. I hope uh, brings some more strength to you, helps you to carry on the work that you do and continues to let you know that you're in the right place doing the right thing because you're perfect the way you are. And, and I, for one, am very great, grateful for everybody here. And just wish the best for everybody. And uh, close your eyes, let the song take over me.
Take a deep breath and uh, carry where you are as long as you need to. Just when you're ready, just feel the chair that you're sitting on. And again, the stillness around you, the stillness within you, knowing that you're the result of all the people who came before you and that you're carrying this knowledge forward. An honest and rigorous, honest way. Every day, take risks. Risks have to be taken. And when we take those risks, the rewards come. So let every step you make a prayer so you have reverence for life, for all living things. And so with that, I say, all my relations, and have a beautiful day. Hi, Zepka, all my relations. And with that, we'll end our day. Have a great afternoon, everyone, and uh, safe journeys home if you're not home already. Yeah, well. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs>